Okay, good morning, everybody. We'll wait a minute or two to see what kind of traffic we might get through as we go into chapter number 10, which deals with liabilities and bonds. And here we are. Good, good morning, morning, John. How you doing? Not too bad. How about you? All right. I guess we're ready to roll here. We got a, a nice chapter on the subject of liabilities. All right, I'll let you know when I can see the slides. Excellent, that's a good policy. <laughs> I can see them. Excellent, excellent. So here we go. Re reporting, analyzing liabilities, we're gonna talk about current liabilities, bonds, bonds again, and then some other types of liabilities. Companies can raise money um, two different ways, big corporations I'm talking about. You can borrow money from creditors. In other words, you can issue a bond to the world. You say, I'm, I want to borrow a billion dollars to build a factory in Ecuador. Um, I'm going to pay 3% interest. Anybody want to loan me this money? Hopefully you get enough coming in to do what you want to do with that money. Or you can issue stock to the world. There you're giving away ownership of the company. Uh, but you have no debt and you don't have to pay any uh, interest. So each one has certain advantages and disadvantages. In this chapter, we're only talking about the debt side. We're going to be borrowing money. And debt is considered riskier than equity because with debt, you have to pay it back. you got to pay it back, man. You have to pay it back with interest. And creditors can force bankruptcy if they're not getting satisfaction in terms of getting paid and require you to sell your assets. So debt, debt is considered a little bit riskier than equity. Liabilities defined and classified. We know this already. Current liabilities less than a year and non-current would be a year or more over. So the, if the maturity is less than a year, it's a current liability. If the maturity is greater than that, it's a long-term or non-current liability. And this is kind of a little bit of a review here. Liabilities are probable debts or obligations resulting from past transactions. I think we know what liabilities are, huh? Current and non-current. And here's a look at how your liabilities are gonna look on a financial statement. Here's a partial balance sheet from Morris Company. And they have a big total heading called liabilities. And then on the, this is the multiple step uh, balance sheet. They have current liabilities, and then they're laid out in the order of notes payable, accounts payable, current maturities of long-term debt. That will always be the next month due on a long-term debt. And any accrued liabilities. As soon as you see the word accrued, you know it's a current liability, okay? You don't accrue long-term liabilities. And one of the comment, I've never seen anything but accounts payable at the top of the current liability list. Why they start with notes payable, I don't know. So we total up the current liabilities and we do the same thing for the long-term. The long-term are the bonds. Any discount or premium has to be added or subtracted from that. Any notes payable, long-term leases, and other things you can imagine, other borrowing arrangements. Current liabilities. Boy, they're really giving us a lot on current liabilities, huh? A debt a company expects to pay within one year. What is a current liability? It's the debt that's due within a year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. For our purposes, it's one year. One year, current liability. What is a note? A note payable is a written promissory note. It specifies the interest rate. It can be issued for various periods of time. To the lender, interest is a revenue. To the lender, we're going to collect the interest. To the borrower, we're gonna pay the interest. So what's a revenue to one party <coughs> is an expense to the other, okay? And then we have our simple formula here, interest equals principal times rate times time. Hey, good morning, Josh, how you doing? Good morning, boss, good, good. Good, you just got here at a good time. We're just starting off with current liabilities. Perfect.
So here we go. Let's look at, our, at notes for the first time. Toyota borrows $100,000 for four months, annual interest rate 12%. Whenever you see the interest rate, you are to assume it's for one year, okay? So that would be $12,000 per year on this note, 100,000 times 12. Compute the interest on the note. Well, it's only for four months. So what did they do? They took 12% times uh, 100,000. That is 12,000 or 1,000 a month for four months to come up with the interest amount. They borrowed the money. Here is the what they borrowed. They borrowed 100,000. Debit cash, credit notes payable. And this is a short-term note. And now the interest is due at the end of the year, or at least they have to accrue it. So they debited interest expense and they credited accrued interest payable. Now it's time to pay back the note. At the end of four months, this company, Toyota has to pay back a total of $104,000, right? The note payable was a $100,000 liability that they're eliminating. Plus they have to pay $4,000 worth of interest. That would be, it's interest payable here because they accrued it in this, and it happened to coincide with the end of the year. Uh, more likely that would say interest expense and you would get that, uh, you'd pay that maybe later. We go from there. Hi, Judith. Hello. How are you doing? Okay, okay, just getting here toward the beginning, Judith. Okay, perfect. Fine in you. We were just we were just talking a little bit about current liabilities, which I think we were pretty good on. And we started a little bit into notes. Let's talk about sales tax payable. Sales taxes are stated as a percentage of the sales price. Collects tax from the customer and we remit it. Company doing the selling remits it to the state's uh, Department of Revenue. What's interesting about sales tax? Uh, oh, never mind. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of a credit card expense. Forget that. There's nothing interesting about sales sales tax, other than what you're going to see here. Sales tax payable. The Marsh Cash Register readings for Cooley Grocery sales of ten thousand. Sales tax of six percent. That was six hundred dollars. Simple journal entry, huh? Cab at cash. Credit your revenue for 10, credit sales tax payable. And this is your entry to record a sale, including a cash sale, including sales taxes. The sales tax money does not belong to the company. Cooley Grocery does not own this money. It's not their money. It belongs to the customers who paid them. And Cooley's responsibility is to turn it over to the proper taxing authority. Well, we've been on over unearned revenues a number of times, uh, I think. Unearned revenue. These are monies received in advance of putting uh, a project together, in advance of doing the work, in advance of providing the service. Uh, right now, I'm, I, I, uh, I have that relatives flying out from New Jersey in a couple of weeks, and I, I paid for their airfare. So I paid it a couple months ago. When United Airlines got my money, they debited cash and they credited unearned revenue. It's only when that plane lands in LAX next month that they can recognize the revenue, unearned revenue. And that's what we're seeing here. Superior University sells 10,000 season football season tickets, $50 each. It's a five game schedule. So they got $500,000 before the season even began, before the opening kickoff of the first game. Now, as each game is played, they can recognize that revenue. And they're gonna do so with a credit to ticket revenue and a debit to the liability on earned ticket revenue to reduce that. What do we got here? If cash is borrowed, how much interest, how much interest would be uh, incurred by December 31st? September, October, November, December, that's four months. 12 times five is 60. That's $1,500 if I did that right. At two, well, it's 2,000, <laughs> having not done it right in my head. Let's look at this real quick. 
Cash register had sales of 23,320 and the sales tax rate is six. We just multiply that out. And what amount of rent revenue should be recognized by December 31st? Uh, we, we collected it on November 1st. So that's two months of rent that we'd have to worry about. Payroll liabilities. Yeah, I'm not gonna spend any, any more real time on payroll. I'll tell you why. This is not gonna be much on the test. I can tell you that right now. Very little of the payroll questions, I believe are gonna be on the test. And second of all, we have a payroll course that some of you may wanna take someday, a payroll class that's uh, rather interesting with, with Professor Pamela Fack. Yeah, I'm gonna get through that. Employer federal taxes do not include federal income tax. Just take a look at the journal entry to record the payroll though. It's basically your, your, your paycheck. You debit salaries and wages expense and you credit, you, you take the gross pay, gross pay equals salaries expense, net pay equals cash. Every one of the withholdings from your paycheck is a liability called a withholding or a payable like you're showing here. Okay, now we get into some good stuff. Bonds, <laughs> bonds typically sold in small denominations of a thousand. They, they can be sold for anything, but that's a good tip. When you're doing a problem and you're not sure what the balance of the bond is after a while, um, just remember that the bond payable will always be that zero, 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 even number. The bond payable will always be that original number you, you issued out. You never debit or credit the bond payable once you put it on, on the financial statements. So what's a bond? You're borrowing money. The person who buys the bond, the bond holder, invests in the bonds. And here they're repeating a slide from earlier, but I'll go over it one more time. Companies can raise money two ways, by debt, which is what we're doing in this chapter. These companies want to borrow money to raise money as opposed to issuing stock to the public, okay? Let's take a peek at bonds, advantages and disadvantages. I hope you find this a little bit interesting. The advantage of a bond, well, if we borrow the money, we maintain control because we have not given away any of the company in uh, dividends or new stock issues like we would if it was an equity deal. At least the interest expense is tax deductible. That's a good thing, I guess. And the impact on earnings, this one makes me laugh. The impact on earnings can be, posit be positive if the money can be borrowed at a low interest rate and invested at a higher interest rate. Yeah, like that's a sure thing. If you guys know any sure things like that, let me know, okay? Disadvantages of bonds. Well, if you don't pay people back, that can drive you into bankruptcy. You gotta pay that interest on, on a timely basis. And if you don't, you're in big trouble. And of course, you just can have a, bad, a negative effect on your cash flows because you have to meet these obligations. Let's look at a bond. That's an old, this is a real old fashioned looking bond. Yeah, you can't even read it. But it's a, <laughs> boy, this bond must be old, huh? It's, a, it's Midland Railway Company of New Jersey. Uh, having grown up in New Jersey and no, ride the trains there all the time. I never heard of Midland uh, Railroad Company. But anyway, what the point I want to make is it's got all the particulars on it. It's got 1,000. It, you can't quite read it, but it, it tells you all the particulars. It tells you when the payments are due, how much the payments are. It'll have the principal. It'll have the rate. It'll have all the details you need in the bond. Bond certificate. Let's understand our terms, especially these three terms here, which are going to come into play later today. Bond terms, principal. We can also call it the par value, the face value, the maturity value. I think face value is what we want to say to ourselves. The reason is the face value, the face value can change as the bond is discounted or uh, adjusted with a premium. 
So you have the face value of the bond. You have the coupon rate, the coupon rate. This is the rate of interest that you see on the bond itself, the bond. If you're looking at this bond here, the rate is 5.75% due 2021, okay? The coupon rate. The only thing you do with the coupon rate is calculate the amount of interest to be paid to the lender, okay? And then we have a third term I'd like you to understand clearly, market rate, also known as the yield or effective interest rate. We call it the market rate or effective interest rate, either one. This is the interest rate that is in the market right now. In other words, this bond here pays 5.75, but everybody else in your type of business, in, that, in your environment, they're paying 5.50%. For some reason, you're paying more than the market. And that difference between 5.75 and 5.50 is going to be either a discount or a premium. So since you're paying less than the rate, you're going to be paying, at a, paying a discount. And let's hopefully we can bring this all together as we go along here. Bond payable and indenture, that's just the contract. Indenture is the bond contract. No assets are pledged. A debenture is simply the contract. It's unsecured, unsecured. It means that Joshua went to the bank today and he walked in there and he said he wanted to borrow $1,000. And they looked at Joshua and they said, they see an honest man. They handed him $1,000 and he walked out. There was no security for the bank, no collateral. They're trusting that Joshua's going to come back in two months and repay that 1000 Secured bonds are the opposite. Secured bonds, assets are pledged as a guarantee of repayment at maturity. Well, I went in and I tried to borrow $1,000 and they, 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 they knew a crook when they saw one when I walked in. And they said, yeah, I'll loan you $1,000, Bob, but I need the title to your car, which I'll be glad to return when you uh, pay me back. Secured versus unsecured. Callable bonds. Bonds can be called, meaning they're purchased back for early retirement. And this will be part of what we're going to learn a little bit later. Uh, an example might be you company borrows money at 10%. They borrowed money and they're paying 10%. And over time, over three, four years, the interest rates in the market go down way below 10. They go down to say 2%. Well, this company would be nuts to keep paying the 10% when they can call the bond back, pay you off, and reborrow at 2%. And a convertible bond is a bond that may be converted to stock. You own bonds in Coca Cola, and you've been also looking at their stock, and you think, well, I think the stock is ready for a push. You can call Coca-Cola and say, dear Coca-Cola, take my $10,000 bond and cash it in and buy $10,000 worth of common stock, please. And some uh, terms here I don't think we'll get involved with on the test, but let's just let's look at a few of them. The bond issuer prepares a prospectus. That's a booklet, the way I, I think of it. It's a booklet. And it's, uh, it tells you all about the bond issue. They're, they're going to tell you why they're borrowing the money, what they're going to do with the money, what they hope to achieve after they've spent the money. It's going to include the interest rate they're willing to pay. Uh, it's going to include audited financial statements. And then using that perspective, the public can be informed. And an informed public is, is, a, is a good investor. And you can decide whether you want to loan this company money or not. And the perspective contains covenants to protect the creditors. Those are just the different rules and laws that are in, in place with, with the bond. The trustee, that's, that, that he just helps the issuer get the bonds out. Again, on this page, I don't think you're going to have any real, real, real questions. They might ask what a, what a prospectus is. Now, determining the price of a bond, the current marketplace, the current, let me say that again, I didn't read that right. The current market price, the present value of a bond is a function of three factors. 
one, how much money are we borrowing? What is the length of time until the amounts are received? And more importantly, most importantly, the market rate of interest, that effective rate. And we may have to, we may have to pay a discount or get a premium depending on our interest rate as it compares to the market. So let's take a peek here. Acropolis Company issued 100,000 9% bonds due in five years and the interest is payable twice a year, okay? So they went in and they determined what's called the present value. And we're gonna talk hopefully a lot about present value in a few minutes. The present value of that 100,000 is 64,993. The present value of the 9,000 annually for five years is 35. It adds up to 100. In other words, this bond was issued at an interest rate equal to the market, no discount or premium. Present value of 100,000. These two numbers equal each other. That 100,000 equals the 65. This 9,000 equals the 35,000. Why am I saying that? What we're saying is $100,000, which we're gonna to have to pay back in five years, is worth 64,993 in today's spending. So we need to have today $64,993 in the bank today, presently, in order to pay the 100,000 in the future. Same thing here. We're gonna to have to pay $45,000 in this annuity for five years. For that, we need 35,007 now. And we'll go into present value more as we go along here. It's a tricky little concept, but I think it's an interesting one and certainly an important one. Those of you, those of you, those of you who are majoring in business, you'll be dealing with present value probably quite a lot as you get into the workforce. Certainly those of you who are future entrepreneurs, you'll be looking at present values like crazy as you consider investments. Bond terminology, these are good to know. These could be, this, these, each one of these could easily be on the test, huh? Mortgage bonds and sinking funds are both examples of security. Yeah, unsecured bonds are known as debentures. Yep. Contractual interest rate is the rate investors, no. Nope. The rate investors demand is called the market rate. The face value is the amount of the principal that you must pay. And the market price of the bond is equal to its maturity value. That's a bunch of baloney. Accounting for bond transactions. Corporation only records bond transaction when it issues or redeems, so it buys back the bonds. Bonds can be issued at face value, meaning that the it's a $100,000 bond and the public agreed to give us $100,000 because our interest rate equaled the market rate. But they can be issued at below face value or above the $100,000, okay? The market interest rate is listed in the bond indenture. No, that's the rate that investors demand for loaning funds. Now you may be asking yourself, why would a company loan money at 6% when the market rate is four? It seems, seems foolish, right? Well, the reason is the company may have to do that because their record is not that good. Uh, the company's financials are not uh, showing much promise. So people are, have to take on more risk. They'll demand more interest, interest payments. Here's a good slide to uh, peek at for a while until you get it clear. The bond interest rate, the rate we're, we're willing to pay the world 10%. We're telling the whole world, we pay 10%. If the market rate happens to be the same at that time, then the bond will go out at $100,000. If we're paying 10% when the market rate is 12, no one is going to give us $100,000 for that bond. We're only going to get 96,000 maybe. And that difference between the 100 and the 96 is called a discount that needs to be amortized over the length of the bond. 
if we're paying more, like on the top row here, we're paying 10 when the market is rate eight, people are going to come to us like crazy, assuming the risks are the same. People are going to come to us like crazy to borrow our money. So we're not going to get $100,000. We're actually going to get maybe 109,000, 112,000, something like that. Candlestick issued five year bonds. Oh, it says 1,000 on top. They mean, oh, I see what they did 100 times 1,000. Okay. They issued $100,000 worth of bonds. What's the basic journal entry to get going? We debit cash. We credit bonds payable. In this example here, the interest rates in the marketplace and what we were paying are identical. So there's no premium or discount to worry about. Then we have to accrue interest at the end of each year, huh? So the interest was 10%, 10% of 100,000 is 10. We will, at the end of the first year, debit interest expense credit interest payable, and then probably we'll have to pay that the next month, the $10,000. You pay the interest every year until the bond is finished. And here we are, we're making the payment now in January. We set up this payable over here, and now we're debiting interest payable, crediting cash, okay? I think we've seen this before the difference between the interest rates and their impacts. Review question. Laurel issues 10 year bonds, maturity of 200,000. If the bonds are issued at a premium, this indicates that the, it tells me that the interest rate we're paying is uh, more than the contract. Yeah, it should be A if there's a God in heaven. Okay, the contractual interest rate exceeds the market. We are, we are getting more money because we're paying more than the market. That's called a premium. Now, here we go into the guts of this stuff. Assume on January 1st, Candlestick Inc. sold a $100,000 five-year bond at 10% but they're telling you it was only 98% of face value. So they didn't get $100,000, they got 98,000. They wanted to borrow 100, but no one was gonna give us $100,000 if we're only, only paing 98% of the 10,000, the 10%. So we debit cash for 98, we debit a contra liability account called discounts on bonds payable for 2000 and we credit bonds payable. So at the end of this deal, we only got 98,000 in cash, but on the back end, we have to pay 100,000, the full 100. And that bonds payable number there, that's never gonna change. What will change is the uh, face value. And they're just showing you how it looks on the financial statements. And this is pretty typical. Bond payable, 100, less the discount, 98,000 to start. Here they're giving a fairly complicated look at um, the accounting for this thing. The annual interest rates, a bond discount, 2052, okay. 52,000 principal. Oh boy, I don't like this slide at all. I don't like that slide at all. I'm using my authority to skip that one. But, but I mean, I understand it's just clunky. Yeah, the principal is 100,000 and then the annual interest payments are 150. So 150,000 is the actual cash. Less than 98 they received gives you total cost of borrowing. I've never seen it presented like that. Now, let's get into a good word. Amortization. Oh, amortization. Amortization is allocated to each financial period each month. It increases the amount of income, interest expense reported each period 
if it's a bond discount. The amount of interest expense will exceed contractual amount. It's amortized, the balance declines. The carrying value will increase until the bonds equal their face amount. Let's take a deep breath and make, let me make this as simple as I can. Amortization is the act of changing the bond discount or the bond premium into interest expense. In other words, with the discount, we're always going to be debiting interest expense and crediting the bond discount until the bond discount is zero and we're back to the 100,000. And let me see if I can demonstrate that in a little bit. Here we go. Bonds issued at a premium. Wow, look at this. We're paying a, we're paying a lot more interest than some than the market. So we received $102,000 for our bond, not the 98 from before when we were paying lousy interest. So now take a look at this, guys. We get cash in excess of 100. We only wanted to borrow 100, but the public gave us 102. So that $2,000 that $2, is a liability account called a bond premium premium on bonds payable. If a bond is sold for less than uh, uh, maturity value, that's a discount sold for more, it's a premium. And I know those kinds of questions would be on the test. And they're just showing you how it looks on the, the balance sheet. I'm not gonna go through this cost of borrowing thing again. Amortization of bond premium. This is pretty much the same as a discount except we're going to be decreasing the interest expense each month and get the balance down to $100,000. Do it. Giant issues, 200,000 for 189. Journal entry, I don't think they give us that. Oh, they do, finally. The journal entry to record the issuance. Well, we issued $200,000 bonds for 189. So we know that the cash we received is 189. And it means that the discount is 11. And here it is. Debit cash, 189. Credit bonds payable. Discount is 11. Here, we wanted, we tried to borrow $200,000, but the, but the world said, we're not paying that your interest rate. Your interest rate is, is, too, is uh, too low for us. So we only got 189. The 11,000 is the discount amount. How much do we have to pay back at the end of the years, at the end of the period? The whole 200,000. So we only received 189,000, but we got to pay back two bills, okay? And notice how they're reported on the, on the balance sheet. Bond payable, less the discount equals 189. This is, I wish they would show the third one, show this as the third line. This is called the face value of the bond. That's the face value of the bond. And that face value is going to change every time we amortize something. Every time we amortize something. Here they're redeeming the bonds. They're just paying it back. Debit bond payable, credit cash. What if we want to buy the bond back? Remember we talked about callable bonds. We said we can call up the uh, borrower or the lender rather and pay them back. When a company retires bonds before maturity, it's necessary to eliminate the carrying value of the bonds or the face value, same thing. And the carrying value of the bond at the redemption date, the face value less the unamortized face value plus I'm making this much too complicated by reading from this. Let me, let me try to simplify this as well. When we redeem a bond, the face value of the bond by definition is going to be somewhere between $100,000 and the amount of cash you received originally. The number in between that's called the carrying value or face value, which goes up or down depending on discount or premium. So let's take a peek here. 
we're paying back. We, we they sold bonds for 103, and the carrying value on this particular date is 100,400. So let's take a look at this. Well, we know we have to debit bonds payable for $100,000. And there's still a premium left on the books of 400, 400. So we have to debit that to get rid of it. And we know we have to pay back 103,000. The 2,600 in this case is a loss, is a loss. We know we have to pay back 103 because they retired the bonds at 103. That's what they're telling us. When, when you buy back a bond, you normally have to pay a, a penalty for doing that. And that's what they have here, a 3% penalty. And the result is a loss on the bond redemption. We lost $2,600, but we got our, what we got our money back, what we, we paid back the lender. And now we can hopefully reborrow at lower interest rate. And here's a bond redemption. It's the same thing. You debit bonds payable, you credit cash, and you get rid of the discount or premium. And anything that falls out is a gain on the bond redemption. Bond redemption is a little bit tricky. I would I would say in your notes right now, copy copy this journal entry down. Debit bonds payable. Second line would be discount or premium on bond payable. Third line would be cash. And then the fourth line would be gain or loss on bond redemption. So if you got a bond redemption multiple choice question, you can quickly drop the numbers into this template that I'm recommending. It's up to you, up to you guys. How liabilities are reported and analyzed. Hey boy, we've been over this, huh? Okay, let's talk about a couple of new metrics you're seeing for the first time, I think, okay? Well, actually, this one we've, we've seen a lot. The current ratio, our friend, the current ratio, remember that? The current ratio, asset, current assets divided by current liabilities. Current assets divided by current liabilities. And what's interesting in this example here is these guys are not really solvent. They don't have enough. They don't have enough money to pay back all their current debts if they wish to do so. If they did, that 0.891 means that 10.9 cents would be lacking. In other words, they want to pay back 100, 100%, and they're only able to pay 89.1. And that is a problem. A couple others, okay? Debt to assets. Just take total liabilities divided by total assets. That'll give us a number that might be of use to investors. Total liabilities divided by total assets. Here's a, here's a trickier one called times interest earned. We're gonna take our net income plus the interest expense plus income tax expense, huh? Net income plus interest expense and income tax expense. We're then gonna divide that by the interest expense. And that's gonna give us a measurement of what we're getting out of our borrowing, what we're getting out of our interest expense. And these ratios measure the ability of a company to survive over a long period of time. Here we go, debt to assets, the debt, 176682. Let me see if they're using the numbers up here. Yeah, see it right here? 176682 is the amount of total liabilities, total assets of 212. We're just dividing those out. Come on. They divide it out to get 83%. So they're fin they finance their assets to the tune of about 83% debt. That might be a high number for some companies. It might be a, a, a low number for others. Depends on your situation, depends on your industry, the expectations. Times interest earned. This one's a trickier one, huh? We're gonna take the net income, which in this case happens to be a negative number because they lost money, but you're gonna take the net income 
plus the interest expense, plus the income tax expense and divide it by the interest expense. So this company is generating income beyond their, um, they're coming with a multiple of 22.3 times. I'm trying to think about the, the best way to explain this. What we're showing basically is what we're getting for our, for our interest money, okay? We're turning this over 14.3 times a year. If you divide 360 by 14, that would give you the number of days that they get their interest uh, money back. Contingency. Now, the, your book doesn't go into the detail that the uh, McGraw-Hill book does, so I'll, I'll talk briefly. Contingency. Events with uncertain outcomes that may resent potential liabilities. Contingency. Something happened today that will have an impact in the future. I will lose weight when I go back on my diet. I will lose weight contingent on um, eating properly. You will earn an A in the class contingent upon studying real hard. But what we're really talking about here are lawsuits, lawsuits. And they don't go into any detail at all after this, but I'm just going to tell you anyway, for your own information, when you are, when a company is sued, your legal people have to look at the lawsuit and decide whether you might lose it, you might win it, or it's such a stupid lawsuit, we can ignore it altogether. If it's one you might win, one you might win, you, you maybe not don't have to put that up on the financials. But if it's one you're gonna lose, you have to put up there. And if it's a stupid one, you ignore it. I wanna look at the test and see if they go into questions like that. They shouldn't. Off balance sheet financing. Yeah, we could all learn this and then we're gonna to have to make our escape undercover at night to uh, the Cayman Islands. Pretty illegal. Analyzing liabilities, my God, we should know the current ratio in the working capital by now, huh? Compute the debt to assets ratio, as well as the times interest earned. Times interest earned. So let's take a peek here. Let's see what we got. The total debt is 34,700. And the assets so I'm sorry, where's the total? Uh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I confused myself. The total liabilities are right here. The eight and 16, 24,000. So that'd be 24 divided by the 34,000 gives you 69.2%. And the times interest earned, well, that's going to be the 14, they're not showing the numbers on here. Oh, here, they give it to you here. 14, 2,800, 900 for interest expense divided by the interest. And this thing is giving me a hard time. What is wrong with you? Okay, we'll do it this way. Okay, we talked about amortizing. Amortizing. How do we amortize? Uh huh. To amortize a bond, we need we need to compute the interest expense on the bond at the market rate. We need to get the interest expense that we're paying, which is the coupon rate. And then we can come up with the amortization amount. Any difference would be the amortization. And I think after we go over this a little bit, you're not going to find this too tough. We can have straight line amortization. You divide the discount of the premium by the number of the periods and go from there. Okay, let's take a look at, oh, excuse me, one moment here. Take a peek at straight line amortization. 
Candlestick issued $100,000 bonds, okay? The stated rate. The stated rate is the coupon rate. That's the amount we're going to have to pay every year. So every year for these four years or whatever it is, two years, we have to pay $10,000 a year. And since it's paid twice a year, it'd be $5,000, okay? The market rate was 12. So if we're only paying 10, we are not going to get $100,000. In fact, the issue price was 88,530. The discount was 11,470. The bonds have a 10 year, they don't have a 10 year, they have a two year, two year life, okay? Is it 10 years? Where does it say 10 years? Okay, 10 year life, whatever. So let's see what we have here. The total discount is 11,470. That's the $100,000. The one hundred thousand dollars we borrow, less the eighty-eight five thirty we actually received. So the public only gave us eighty-eight thousand five hundred and thirty dollars for this bond, and we still have to pay a hundred thousand dollars back at the end of the period. So look at our discount: one hundred thousand minus eighty-eight five thirty equals eleven four seventy. There are 20 payment periods involved. It is a 10-year bond, a 10-year bond. So there's 20 payments to amortize. Okay, take a look at this journal entry. And then in a few more slides, I've got something that I think will clarify this a little bit more as we go along. How much cash do we have to pay twice a year? Remember, it was 10% of $10,000. That's $10,000 twice a year, 5,000. We credit cash, 5,000. We have a discount sitting there. That's the uh, 11,500 something number. We divide that by 20, we got 574. We got 574, that becomes a credit there. The total interest expense is five five seven four. What I hope you, what I hope gradually washes over you as you do the homework, is that the interest expense is not necessarily the amount of cash that we're paying in interest. You have two components of interest. You have the cash which we're paying, and then you have the amortization of the discount or premium, which has to be subtracted from that cash amount. Because this is a premium, a discount, we have to pay back more than five thousand. We have to pay back five thousand five seventy four. I have a question. Yeah. So is amor amor amortization yep. uh, an account that you have to like debit or credit, or is it just like a calculation? No, no, it, it's an account in the in the what instead of amortization, let's use the word. Um, in the, Discount or premium. Amortization oh. is just a mathematical function. Perfect. If that answers, that's a good question. If that answers your question. It does. Yeah. Thank to, you. To, to amortize something in this, this chapter here is to take a discount or premium and turn it into interest expense. Amortization is the act of creating income expense from the premium or discount. You good with that, Joshua? Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, good too. Hey, look at this one now. Now, I hope this rings the bell a little bit for you now. I know this is not easy stuff, seeing it for the first time. Well, let's take a look here. Remember that bond, we sold it for $88,530, guys, right? And it had a discount of 11470 so here's our hundred thousand dollars. We only got eighty-eight five thirty because we were paying a lousy interest rate. The difference or shortfall is called the discount. So at the beginning, we have cash we debited for eighty-eight five thirty. We debited the discount for eleven four seventy, and we credited bonds payable for the one hundred. Now we have we have to. For the next 10 years, 
twice a year, we have to amortize. And where do we get the amortization money? We got it from taking the 11470, since this is straight line, and dividing it by the number of periods. And it turned out to be $574. Right here, 11,470 divided by 20 periods, 10 years, twice a year. So every six months, we're amortizing $574, which means that the discount is going down by $574, and the book value is going up by 574. And we're gonna repeat this process 20 times, at which time the discount will be zero and the book value will be up to 100,000. And then we can make the final payment back where we debit bond payable for 100 and we credit cash. So 574 is part of our interest expense, but we have another component, the 5,000. Let's not forget this guy. We have to pay $5,000 every six months to this investor. So that's certainly a part of our interest. You have 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, 574, 574. We add them together, there's your total interest expense. There's your total interest expense. So here's your journal entry. You debit, you can take the journal entry right off here. You debit interest expense, 5,574, you credit 574 to the discount, that's the amortization, and you credit cash or interest payable. And here's an example right here. You debit interest expense. In this case, you credit the discount and you credit cash, bonds. Zero coupon bonds, I'm not gonna talk about that really. Zero coupons don't pay any uh, cash interest. What happens is they give you a big discount at the beginning, uh, you, you buy the bond, then you just, you just pay the principal back uh, late, later on. There's really not much to it. I don't hear much talk about zero coupons uh, anymore. All I know is that they're always issued at a deep discount. There's no cash paid for the interest. You'll get a number today, you'll get 60,000 today, and then you pay it back, you pay it back like 80 or whatever the number was to begin with. Now, let's look at a premium. Oh, premium. This time Candlestick is paying 10%. They're still paying 10%, but now the market rate is eight. So that results in what's called a premium. A premium, okay? Stated rate is greater than market rate. That's gonna give us a premium. Let's take a peek here. Here we go. We're still doing straight line. We have 130, we got $113,592. Is that great? We only wanted to borrow 100 and we got a check for 113,592. Why? Because our interest was so much higher. Our interest was 25% above market, <laughs> which is really a, a tremendous spread. And if that ever happened, we'd have panic in the marketplace. But anyway, for purposes of teaching it, they have a big spread. So anyway, we're going to take the 13,592 and we're going to divide it by 20, just like we did before. And that comes out to six hundred and eighty dollars, six eighty. Here we go. We know we have to spend five thousand cash every six months. We know we have six hundred and eighty. This time it's a debit because the premium is a liability account to be reduced with a debit, and the interest expense is only forty three twenty. In other words. With a premium, your total interest expense is less than the cash amount you're paying. 
because you have a favorable, if you want to call it that, amortization. Favorable amortization. Let's take a look at this one again. 100,000 minus the 113,592. 13,592 divided by 20 is 680. So how does this thing work? We have 680 being amortized. And now what we do is compare it to the 5,000. The difference is going to be your interest expense. The difference is gonna be your interest expense. In other words, the interest payment plus or minus, plus or minus the amortization amount equals the total interest expense. So what are we doing? What are we? What, what is amortizing all about? It's about taking this 113,592 and getting the balance down to $100,000 in 10 years. So we start off with 113,592. We subtract 680. We get 112,912. We subtract 680. Subtract, see how it's going down? And at the end of 10 years, you'll be down to $100,000, okay? Look at the premium. Premium's coming down. So with a discount, with a discount, we're starting with a lower number and going up to 100,000. With the premium, we're starting with a higher number and coming down to 100,000. Come on, come on. Now, what I just showed you guys was the straight line method of amortization. Straight line is not gap. Straight line is a simple, easy way to do the calculation though. Um, where I worked for a long time, I wasn't that involved in the amortizings of bonds and things, but I do know the auditors would come in and one of their questions when they're looking at your balance sheet is, how are you computing your bond amortizations? Because we did borrow money. And we would say we're using straight line. And the auditors would go, uh oh, that could be a problem. So the auditors would run it, run the numbers through their own program. And what happened every single year was the difference was not that great, was not deemed material. So they said you're okay with straight line. If there was a big difference, a material difference, they'd have to adjust that for us. So here we go, effective interest method. Compute the premium amortization using effective interest. Okay, this is a totally different ball game than straight line. Here we have Okay, let me I don't want to I want to express myself clearly here. The book value of the bond, the face value, the, the amount that keeps changing, you multiply that by the effective interest rate, meaning the market rate, you get the total interest. I would write that down. <laughs> the face value of the bond, the car let's call it the carrying value really what it is. The carrying value of the bond times the effective interest rate gives you the total interest, which in this case is 4,544. We know we have to pay 5,000 in cash. The difference that's amortized is thus 456, 456. Really, that's the only thing you, you need to understand to, to push yourself through this. The carrying value of the bond, which changes every year, the carrying value of the bond times the effective interest rate gives you the total interest. You compare that to the interest in cash and you come up with the amortization up or down. And here we go. We're looking at the interest payments. We are going to debit interest expense for 4,444, 4,544. And we're amortizing 456. We know that. 
and that adds up to the 5,000 in cash. So notice here that our total interest expense is less than the cash payment. I have a question on the effective yeah. interest rate. Yep. So um, like you had mentioned before, everything we need to know about the bond is on the bond. So would the effective interest rate be on the bond? Excellent question. The answer is no. No. The effective interest rate is what the world is paying for money at that point in time. In other words, on any problem, or any question, they're going to have to tell you what the market interest rate is, which is the same thing as the effective interest rate. In other words, you're borrowing money at 10%. And the, and the effective interest rate is 12. Well, no one's going to borrow money from you. Why would they only get 10% when they get 12%? Okay. All right, here we go. Thank you. I would suggest looking at this screen right here now. This is taken from the other book. This is not in your textbook, but we think it's better in Adam McGraw-Hill. Book value is 113.592. You have a calculator, Josh? My phone, I still haven't gotten batteries for my other okay. one, but yeah. Yeah, just one second. I forgot what the effective rate was here. Eight percent, huh? Take 113.592 times 0.08, okay. and then I divide that answer by two. By two. I got 4,543.68. Does that look familiar? Oh, okay, yeah. They just round it up? Yeah, just round it up. There you go. Five, so you saw how you did that. All you did was take the market rate times the carrying value with the bond at that time. And then why did we divide it by two, Josh? Because um, how often are we paying it? Twice a year. Oh, twice a year. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's do the next one. I'm going to make you teach this with me, Josh. <laughs> 113136 times 0 0.08 divided by two. And then uh, 4,525 and 44 cents. So there you they go. They rounded, rounded it there. they rounded it to 4525, you think. Okay. So that is our total interest expense. Total interest under this method. We know we have the 5,000 here. So what's the amortization? It's going to be the difference between these two numbers. There's your amortization. And you're going to keep doing that every year multiplying the carrying value or the book value, multiplying the carrying value times the effective interest rate gives you the total interest for that period, for that six months, okay? Keep going here. Yeah. Yeah. The effective interest rate, now we're back in the Wiley book where they make it a little more goofy, but here they're making the same point. The carrying value of the bond times the effective interest rate minus the face amount of the bond times the contractual. They're, to me, they make it too hard with that. That's not very clear to me. But let's go here. Candlestick sold five-year, uh, five $100,000, 10% bonds. And the effective interest rate was a little higher, huh? So they're going to be selling these at a discount. Now, notice the way they do it in, in your book. They are coming up with the present value number that you guys are not seeing in the other one. But again, it's the same thing. Interest to be paid, 10000 The amortization is 324 And the unamortized goes down from 2000 less 324 less 358 et cetera until we get back up to $100,000, okay? Then it comes time to, to uh, accrue or pay the interest. We debit interest expense. We credit the discount. 
and 10,000 in cash or accrued interest payable. Here they sold the bonds. Remember we talked about selling the bonds? They sold the uh, bonds for 102. Here they have a premium because their 10% is higher than the, than the effective rate of 9.47. So what they're doing here is they're taking this number here, the 102, and they're multiplying it by point, whatever that number actually is, 9.47794. So we work it through. What do you think, John? Making a little bit of sense? Yeah, that other um, way of displaying it helped. Um, it, it kind of, in my mind, is starting to be sort of like when you do a mortgage, that as you yeah. pay down the mortgage, yeah. more and more interest becomes paid off. And it's sort of doing the same thing, but from the other angle. Yeah, that's, that, that's sort, of, that's sort of, of like a mortgage. Yeah, where, you put, where the amount of principal you pay goes up every month until your last Exactly. Month. And yeah. that, that, that they're just trying to account for the fact that you're um, – bond value is getting back to par and therefore, you know, the premium's a little bit different. So I'm starting yeah. to get it better. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you want to get that you want to carrying value carrying back, to, value par back to par at the end. Hey, hey Judith, hey, are you, you hanging, in there, hanging in there with us? Judith is mute. No Judith right now. All right. We'll check in with her in a little bit. Long-term notes payable. Now we're back to some kind of easy stuff. Maybe secured by a mortgage. Yeah, there's not much to this. This is this is long-term notes. There's no amortization or anything tricky. They issued a, uh, a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage note. Here you go, John. Here's your mortgage. Cash payment is fifty thousand nine twenty-six. Look how much of that is interest at the beginning. Most of it is interest. Not much of it is principal. But as each year goes by, the amount of interest expense goes down and the amount of principal goes up. And that's very, um, I think, frustrating to all homeowners. And hopefully all of you guys are out there someday buying houses. You're going to find out that your first payment is only going to pay a couple of dollars of the principal. I bought a house in New Jersey uh, many years ago for twenty eight <laughs> for twenty eight thousand dollars, and my first payment, the amount of principal that was paid was only like seventeen dollars. The rest of it was all interest. But then the next year, the next month, when I paid it, it went up to twenty, say, then twenty two, until at the end, your final payment is the total uh, principal due. And that brings us to the end of kind of a tricky chapter, huh, guys? Yep, any, thank you. Any, any, uh, yeah, it's yeah. great, John. Uh, you know, hang in there with us. Hey, Judith, are you there? She may be. She may be. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, were you able to follow along pretty well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is not the easiest chapter in the book by far, uh, but you guys will get there. What do you what do you think, Josh? Call it a meeting. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, but I I did get a little confused with the amortization when like it showed me on the graphs and the charts and everything. But after I'm pretty sure I do the homework and everything, it should clear up. Hopefully but, so. Yeah. The only thing. Go ahead. The only thing that was throwing me off was all these like numbers. <laughs> that's just it. Oh, it just feels overwhelming you know <laughs> yeah 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 it really looks all it does look all look at all this stuff here but you you divide and conquer you know uh you see this grid here this is the one you want to have in front of you when you're doing your homework you've got the powerpoints in canvas so you can find this one and work with it okay all right with with that in mind I think we'll call it a class, okay? All right, we'll see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good one, everyone.
Bye-bye, Julius. Bye-bye.